Joshua chapter 10. Now it came to pass when Adai Zedek, king of Jerusalem. Now this is not Jerusalem now. This is the Jebusites, but this is where Jerusalem will be. Had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it as he had done to Jericho and her king. So he had done to Ai and to her king. How the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. So news is getting around. Here comes Israel. And they're destroying everybody but one particular group of people. That they feared greatly because Gibeon, this is the ones that came to Joshua, was a great city. They were powerful. They were mighty. As one of the royal cities, rich, and because it was greater than Ai, and all the men thereof were mighty. It was a great city, but they had old clothes, old shoes, moldy bread, and old wine bottles. Chapter 9 was not the characteristic of this royal city. In the name and the work of God through Joshua and Israel is coming out, you're doomed. Wherefore Adonai Zeek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hohem, king of Hebron, and unto Parim, king of Jarmuth, and unto Japheth, king of Lachish, unto Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Come up! Jerusalem's a mountain. That's the same problem they have in the New Testament with Jesus. How come they? Keep, how come Jesus keeps saying, "Go up to the to Jerusalem"? It's a mountain. Come up unto me, and help me, that we may smite Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and the children of Israel. Gibeon has has feared and has come to Joshua and made peace with Joshua. Now. All the nations around Gibeon, like, let's kill them. I want to check one reference here before we go. So they're now mad at Israel, and they're mad at people who make peace with Israel. They're all scared of Israel. So we're gathering all nations, sound familiar? Against anybody, we're, we're, we're gathering all nations against anybody who makes a league with Israel. We're not only gathering ourselves against Israel, but anybody, anybody who makes a league with Israel themselves. So when Jesus comes and he says, when you have helped my brethren, and he has separated the goat nations from the sheep nations. And the goat nations have gathered themselves together. And not only are they are against Israel. But when Jesus says to the sheep nations, those that you helped my brethren, you visited my brethren, you gave them medical needs, you, you visited them in prison, you, you gave them food. Now just don't think that that's, you know, humanity working. Because the tribulation period, the nations and the Antichrist are for one thing, to kill that Jew. And if you're going to help that Jew, you are now mocked. And you are under a system that that mark is the only means you're going to eat and the only means you're going to live. And if you're going to help the nation of Israel... Somehow your mark, if you have the mark, I don't know if you're going to get it, it's going to be made void because you can't help Israel and be part of us. And over here it said in chapter 9, verses 14, 15, somewhere it said in there that, you know, they gave victuals, they ate together. We're looking at the tribulation period here. 14. 14. 
So when we read about nations in the tribulation helping the Jews, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be under great conflict. And once you're found out, you are now marked. And in verse 4 of chapter 10, come, everybody, come help me. And verse 5, therefore, five kings, death. Five in your Bible is a number of death. Of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem. Now, who do you think that would be in the tribulation period? Seated in the Holy of the Holies, the temple. Proclaiming himself to be God. He's a king. You read not Daniel? You not read the book of Revelation? The king of Hebron, the king, the king of Jerob, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon. Well, the Bible, Revelation, the Bible, and Daniel tells us there's ten kings. Here are five. Gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their hosts. That's all their horses, that's all their military. And camped before Gibeon and made war against it. Here's the united assembly of the Antichrist. Future 10. Here's the United Assemblies of the Amorites against one city. Why? What was their problem? You went to Israel and you befriended them. Now, America's a great nation, but what will she do when the United Nations say, hey, you know what? You better go with us against Israel, if not, and fill in the blanks. And will America give in? There's one thing America loves. She loves money and she loves oil. I think we fought a couple wars recently in my time over oil by a tycoon president. You can't say things like that. Yes, I can. Verse 6, the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua. This is twice meeting with Joshua to camp. To Joshua to camp to, yeah, unto Joshua's to, to the camp to Gilgal, they're still in Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. We're your servants. That's the oath. Come unto us quickly and save us, help us. And all the kings and Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. We're in big trouble here. We need your help. Going back in Joshua's time. Now, Israel's not going to be able to help these people in the tribulation period. they got no strength. They're running. But here in Joshua, we're troubled. They're going against us, Joshua. You made us your servants. We acknowledge your servants. You swore an oath by your God, and now we need help. And Joshua cannot let it go as, all right, you're going to die. Because he said, as the Lord liveth, you're going to live. Verse 7. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, ascended, going to the mountains, from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. So now what we're going to do is we're going to help these people that weren't supposed to be helped. We're going to help these people that Joshua and the leaders made a peace with, which they weren't supposed to be made peace with, and God is going to have Joshua and the men of Israel kick butt in the land that should have been kicked, and will be kicked. But we just got a little side note about these people giving Joshua was going to do this anyway. But let's see how you are, Joshua, when you make an oath to God, which you shouldn't have done. Let's see you do with what these people. So God is honoring, it says, so Joshua sent to Gilgal, he and all the people war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, He's going to go against five kings now. Fear them not. For I have delivered them into thy hand. Present tense, it hasn't even started yet. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. God has honored the oath. Of chapter 9, verse 15. 9, 15. It came to pass at the end of three days. Uh, 15. And Joshua made peace with them. And made a league with them. And let them live. And back over here in chapter 10, verse 8. God honored that oath. And God is saying, listen, I'm using Gibeon. I'm gathering these five nations to you and go in there and kick their butt. 
And God told him, wipe them all out. But if you make an oath in the name of God, even if it's a sin, Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomforted them before Israel. <laughs> And we got Lord against your side. You ain't doing nothing. And slew them with a with a great slaughter at Gibeon. <laughs> here's the people of God. Here's the people of God by an oath of God who feared God, who came to Israel. They're not supposed to be living, but Joshua made an oath with them. Now here in their city, all these nations are angry with them, and God is defeating them at that city. God is telling Gibeon, okay, I got to protect you. How's that? These five nations are not against, well, they're against Israel, but right now they, they want to conquer Gibeon. And then once we conquer Gibeon, then we're, we're going to go kick Israel's butt. God's like, uh-uh. Gibeon is my people now. And by the oath of Jesus Christ and by the finished work of Jesus Christ, a person that should go to hell, I ain't never going to hell. I am of God. And my victory lies in God and not myself. And the slaughter of Gibeon and chased him along the way that goeth up to Beth Huron, Huron and smote them to Azica and unto Mecca. And you probably find these on, on the map. It came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Horn. So they're going down the mountain, up and down the mountains, valleys. That the Lord, watch this, cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Ezekiah, and they died. And there were more that there were more which died with hailstones. Do you see the reference in the tribulation period about that? There are hailstones in the tribulation period, so you can apply what we're reading into the tribulation period. They're running, and God is like, "Oh, okay, <clears throat> knock them right on the head. <laughs> Ow, don't dead." And he's just chucking hailstorms at them. And there are more people who are dying with those hailstorms than being killed by the sword. And it's almost gotta be it's almost gotta be like comedy, like a like a cartoon, because here's only the enemy of God, and they're being banged in the head and banged in the in the buttocks and banged in the legs by these hailstones. And what God is doing is, is he is stoning the enemies of Israel with hail and ice. When, and again, when God is against you, you ain't going nowhere. And none of these men, listen, how many men does it take of the army to be killed by these hills for not one soldier to turn around and say, God, forgive me? I forgot which was the men that came to Elijah, and the guy comes up with his 50 men. Fire came down, burnt him. The next guy came up with his 50. Fire came down, burnt him. And then the next three, the guy came with his 15 fire. And then the fourth guy's like, please spare me and my troops. Would you kindly please come with me to the king? It took three sets of people being killed before one guy said, have mercy on me. And people are so hard-hearted that when you are involved in a public ministry and the church says, I've got thousands of people saved, that's impossible by the Bible because not one army man here ever turned and got right. They all died. The masses die and go to hell. The few go the broad way, I mean the straight way and get saved. No one repented at this. And though God sent earthquakes, tornadoes, airplanes, famine, earth, whatever God sends, the result of the masses of people, they will not get right with God. People killing with guns in America today are not going to get them right with God, according to the Bible. Now, maybe some... A man going about shooting other people, an earthquake, 
is not the means of the saving grace of that soul. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. A man's not going to get saved by an earthquake or a tornado. He's going to get saved by a Bible preacher. And we ought to go out there and go and preach the gospel. The way God has told us. So when there are events like that that happen in the area. And they have heard the Bible. Maybe at that point they'll get right. The children of Israel slew with a sword. So there are more people that die with those hailstorms. Again, it's God rooting out his people. Let's say there's one Israelite and five enemies. Those five men, poof, they're gone. And that Israelite is still living. And that's God chucking those, uh, just being reasonable. God's chucking those, those hailstones at particular people and preventing Israel from being harmed. That's what happened in Egypt. Separation, division. Then spake Joshua to, now that wasn't a miracle. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. He said in the sight of all Israel. So Israel's listening. Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon. And thou moon, look at capital S, capital M. In the valley of Ajalon. Now what's that? That sun is the god of the Amorites. That moon is the god of the Amorites. And God is about through Joshua. I'll show you how good your gods are. They would panic around December. The winter solstice. Oh, my God, where, where is he? He's not coming up at the right time. Oh my God, where is he? And at the spring, he goes, oh, he comes up nice and early. Isn't that great? When you come around to the time of December, when that, that winter equalizes, the gods of the, the men of the gods of all the following God, they start getting scared. Now, that sun goes around the, the earth. We know that. The moon goes around the earth. Well, God through Joshua... Don't you always count on that? In the tribulation period, we going to read, we are going to study, the fact is that moon is going to turn as blood. You're going to look at the sky, it's going to be a blood moon, literal blood moon. And that sun that's been over your head, or that sun is supposed to come up in the morning for sunrise service, is not going to come up. And Jesus tells us that the times of the tribulation period, that the time is going to be shortened for the elect's sake. And you're going to set your sundial, you're going to set your clock, and it's going to be wrong. You talk about a mess up in daylight savings time. When that sun goes, where did the day go? Well, God quickened the day for the, for the elect. So the sun stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Asia. Don't move, sun. Don't moon. Moon. Don't move, moon. Don't move, moon. Don't move, sun. Wow, that's a tongue twister. And the sun stood still. And the moon stayed. Or is that the earth? <laughs> the, whole, the solar system now has stopped. And when, oh, I forget what king it was now, and, and, and Judy says, let the sundial go back. And Babylon shows up because Babylon is watching the skies. And the wise men from the east, when they see that star approaching for Jesus, don't tell me that people right now are like, what the heck is happening? It's in 2 Kings 20. What's the name of the king? Hezekiah. King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah. Is the re double reaction from what we're reading now? Is that Second Chronicles thirty-two? Second Kings twenty. Okay, yep, I see it right there. It might be second. Nine. Might be second. But we're going to look at that in a minute. The sun and moon and all that stop. There are people worshiping the sun and the moon. What is my God done? 
And it's not your God. It's God Jehovah, the father of Israel, because a Jewish person has said, stop it. The solar system has to stop, and there is record in worldly records that this actually did happen. And the sun and moon are the objects of worship. But Joshua needs a little... Joshua is the first ever recording of daylight savings time. God, I need a little more time to kill these people. You think Benjamin Franklin came up in the daylight savings time? Absolutely not. Joshua did. All Benjamin Franklin could do is set your watches back, but Joshua and God say, just stop it. <laughs> and this would be like when you were in school. Ever since you remember in school, you're sitting at that desk, it's like time stood still. So Isaiah 38, 8. Isaiah 38, 8. I don't know how far we'll get with, with this chapter tonight. But there's other things in the Bible. The solar system stopped with the moon, with the moon the and the sun and the earth. Isaiah 38, 8. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees, which is gone down in the sun dial of Ahaz, 10 degrees backward. So the sun returned, wait, well, that's daylight savings time. The sun returned 10 degrees by which degrees it was gone down. See, God didn't tell Ahaz to move your, your sundial, God moved the sun. See, man can change his walk, its watch, but God is able to change the heavens. And it went back 10 degrees, and I got this elsewhere. Second Chronicles 32. Second Chronicles 32. And Second Chronicles 32, it's like 31. Okay, 31. 21. Oh, I got terrible here. 31. All right, so... Verse 31. How be it, the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder, oops, 31, who sent to inquire the wonder that was done in the land. So, we're going to look at this wonder again. What's happening? Babylon is looking to the sky, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and there was a wonder. Something happened. And where is the first place that Babylonians go? They go to Jerusalem, to the God of the Jews, and say, hey, what was that? And it's that sundial that went back 10 degrees. And that 10 degrees would be 40 minutes. And as we continue to 2 Kings 20. This is recorded three times. 2 Kings 20. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 2 Kings 20 verse 9. There are 360 degrees on the sundial. 
10 degrees would be 20 minutes. So how, and when we read Joshua, we'll see how long Joshua, time has been messed up. In verse 8, 2 Kings 20 verse 8, and Hezekiah said unto Israel, What shall be the sign or wonder to the Babylonians that the Lord will heal me, that I shall go up into the house of the Lord the third day? And Isaiah, this, this is a sign shalt thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go down 10 degrees or go back 10 degrees? As the guy answered, it's a light thing for the shower to go down 10 degrees. To go ahead. But let the shower return backward 10 degrees. Do you see the daylight savings time? Time is either going to go ahead or it's going to go back. And Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord, like Joshua, he, God, brought the shadow of ten degrees backwards by which it was going down on the dial of Ahaz. So when they looked at the sundial, the Babylonians looked at the sun, the shadows went back ten degrees. And I believe it, I got one note here that says 20, I got another note that says 40. And if you figure out the 360 degrees in each each degree in minutes, all that, you'll find the answer. But time has been changed. And not the sundial of Ahaz, not his watch, but the sun and the moon had been changed by God. That's a miracle. That's a sign. The Babylonians said, what was his wonder? And in verse 12, 13, here's the Babylonians showing up. So back to Joshua 10. So daylight saving time is nothing new to God. We in America, in the world today, we do our watches and clocks. God, Joshua, and Isaiah did it by the, the heavenly bodies in the solar system. And this kind of stuff is going to happen too with the Antichrist. He has power over natural phenomena. So verse 13, And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon the enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? What's the book of Jasher? I have no idea. And the Holy Spirit doesn't want us to know. He just wants to know there's a book of Jasher. Jasher means upright or righteous. So the sun still stood still in the midst of heaven. It did not move. It probably freaked out the Native Americans in America. That sun is not moving. It probably brought the Incas down into panic. That sun is not moving. The people in China probably say, Ooh, this is an awful long night. Should have been morning by now. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down about a whole day. Now, if you're a math magician, you can work out Isaiah, Chronicles, and Kings, and Joshua together. They've got it figured out. I don't understand it. And it works. And there is recorded in the world, you can look it up on the internet, Joshua 10 verse 13 is recorded all over the world. As much as a man built an ark and had every living animal in that ark. This had to be seen by the whole world. This is something you can't do in one state of 50. This has to be worldwide. 
And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of man for the Lord fought for Israel. You say, well, what about Isaiah? What about in Hezekiah? The sun and moon did not stop, did it? It just moved. Joshua, it stopped. Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah and Hezekiah, it just went back. It moved. It didn't stop. Joshua, it stopped. Joshua needed a little more time to kill these kings. God said, okay. And God's like, you know, I got to fix that time somehow. I'll just wait for Isaiah and Hezekiah to ask me to do it, and I'll do it. And Joshua returned, and all, you believe that? That's by faith. Never seen it. I believe it. How much do you believe that? I believe that as much as Jesus Christ suffered and died and was buried and rose again, that my God has power over the planets. And when these people today, now they're saying again, we're going to be hit by uh, meteorites. All these me I'm not worried. Because the meteorites ain't going to hit the tribulation period, and I'm not going to be in the tribulation period. I'm not worried about this meteorite, which is out there, called Wormwood. Wormwood is going to come after the church is gone. I'm not worried. And the meteorite's going to hit the earth and going to destroy the earth. I hope it hits my house first. I'm not afraid of death. I'll be absent from the body and presence of the Lord. Okay, you got a new wars? Let me put a big circle on my roof. My, my owner of the house won't appreciate it, but aim here. I'm not concerned. I've got a God that's in control of the planets. If I want to live and serve the Lord and I see a meteorite heading from my house, if, if I can pray to God, repent, and get right with God, I know God has control of that meteorite. I also know that when I'm not going to be here, I'm going to be raptured. I know after that, one point in time, you're going to realize that sun is not going to come up one morning. It's going to be dark as sackcloth. Number two, time is going to go by really quick, according to the book of Revelation. And God is in charge of time. And one day there will be no time, be Revelation 19. Time will stop permanently. In verse 15, Joshua returned all Israel with him unto the camp to Gilgal. Now notice it says all Israel. Does that mean not one person of Israel died? You tell me that all those meteorites and all those uh, hailstorms did not hit one Israelite? You say, well, why hasn't California fallen off into the ocean yet? Because there's some Bible believing Christians that are praying and seeking for people to be saved. That's why someone's praying. God answers prayers. But these five kings fled, wimps, and hid themselves in the cave at Mecca. Mecca. Great kings. And it was told Joshua, saying, The five kings are found hid in a cave at Mecca. Mecca. Let's look at Revelation 6.15. We knew we were going to go there eventually. Revelation 6.15. Church is going in chapter 4. <laughs> Revelation 4, that's it. The church is going. Revelation 6. 8. 6. What did I say? 15. 15. Are you ready for this one? Where did those kings go? They went into a cave. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, that's soldiers, and the mighty men, that's soldiers, every bondman, every freeman, did hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. That's caves. 
and send to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the capital L Lamb. Do you know who these kings are going to meet in a couple verses in Joshua? They're going to meet Jehovah saves, aren't they? They're going to meet the wrath of Joshua. And wait till you see what Joshua does to, does to them. Now, do you think I'm really full of it? Let's look at Revelation 6, 12. You know, what's, you know what 12 divided by 2 is, don't you? 6. You know what 6 plus 6 is, right? 12. Chapter 6, 6 plus 6. I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell upon the earth, There's that sun and moon again. Now it's become dark and it's become blood. It says as blood. I don't know if it's going to be the color of blood. But there it is. There's the tribulation passages that we see in Joshua. Now here's these kings. They've run into the... Oh, my, here comes Joshua. I'm scared. Go out. Oh, oh. The sun has done something. The moon has done something. Run! It's going to happen again. So they run to the cave. And Joshua said, roll great stones. Is that what they did? Is that what they wanted to be done? In Revelation 6? Yeah. Oh, isn't, it, isn't the Bible great when the Bible's great? Roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave and set men by it to keep them. Now, what's that a picture of? People who do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ has got a picture of the empty tomb with the Roman soldiers and the Jewish soldiers staying there, but they're not going to roll that stone away. I don't know about cavemen in the early earth of life on earth, but I know there will be cavemen coming in the near future. And those cavemen are going to be running from the Son of God on that horse. With us behind them. With an earthquake that probably will roll the stones away. Onto those mountains. And keeping them in a place where God can find them. But. So. Roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave and set men by it for to keep them. Make sure they don't go away. And stay ye not, but pursue after your enemies. And smite the hiramos of them. Suffer them not to enter into their cities. For the, this, this picture, Jesus Christ coming back in his bride on the horses as the armies of Joel chapter 2. Let's see Joel chapter 2. The book of Joel, chapter 2. And I'm sorry if you got a Schofield note here about chapter 2. It's wrong. In Joel, chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain, Jerusalem. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord it cometh, second advent, for it is nigh at hand. Joshua is coming. The day of darkness and gloomness, the day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spreads upon the mountains, a great people and strong. That's not what we were just reading? So we just read in tribulation period? There has not been ever the light. Neither shall be any more after. Is that what they said about the sun in Joshua? Neither shall be any the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. The fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. 
The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. Here we come. As horsemen, so they shall run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble. And a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pain. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. That's us. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every one on his ways. And they shall not break the ranks. I'm going to read Joshua says, stay not. Get on that horse and ride after Jesus and don't stop. Verse 7, they shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one on his ways. Keep running, keep going. They shall not break their ranks. You're united. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. Where they, uh, And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. That's us. We're going to keep rank. We're going to keep unity. And no one's going to kill us. Isn't that great? You'd be, you'd be a Christian, but you get stabbed with a sword. Am I supposed to, something about pain. Huh? Something, get that thing out of me. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. What's that? Isn't that Jericho? Isn't that getting, getting the harlot? They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows. Who's that? Rahab. Like a thief. Joshua's going to happen again, my friend. The earth shall quake before them. The heaven shall tremble. The sun and moon, have moved. oh, there they are, shall be darkened. The, sky, the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord shall utter his voice before his army. We're not talking about Israel. For his camp is very great. He is strong that ex executed his word what is that that's coming out of the mouth of god jesus christ when it's second heaven is it not the sword there it is and we read in revelation chapter six at this point everyone let's run to the cave rocks fall on us joshua's coming but stephen in the book of hebrews replaced joshua with jesus didn't they <laughs> I love the Bible. I love the Bible. Stay ye not. That, that's an order to us. But pursue after your enemies and smite them and hinder most of them. Joel 2. Suffer them not to enter into your cities. Joel chapter 2. For the Lord your God has delivered them into your hand. And it came to pass when Joshua and the children of Israel had made an end of slaying them with a very great slaughter. It's going to be a very great slaughter at the, at the time of Jesus Christ. Till they were consumed that the rest which remained of them entered into fenced cities. And the people returned to the camp of Joshua at Mechadea, or however, in peace. None moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel. There will be no more Jewish jokes. There will be no more slander against that Jew. There will be no more death threats against that Jew when Jesus Christ is seated. Then said Joshua, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings un unto me out of the cave. And they did so and brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave. And the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jermith, the king of Lakish, the king of Eglon. And it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war, which went with him, come near. Put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. Victory. Victory. And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And afterwards Joshua smote them. And slew them. And hanged them on five trees. Now is that not a mockery? And they were hanging upon the trees until evening. What is the mockery of that? Let's look at it. Jesus Christ the God suffered and died according to scriptures, correct? And was buried, correct? And arose again the third day, correct? According to scriptures. He hung, he was buried, he came out. 
Well, look at this one. They were in the cave first, and then they're hanging on the tree. It's a mockery of what the world did for Jesus. They ran to the cave to hide. God brought them out, and then he hung them on trees. Be not deceived, God's not mocked. Whatsoever man sows that he shall also reap. May God for those that put Christ on that cross, may God put them on him. And it came to pass at that time of the going down the sun, the sun went back. It, it did what it's supposed to do. That Joshua commanded they took them down off the trees. And cast them, excuse me, cast them into a cave where they had been hid. And laid great stones. Okay, we're back at death burial in the cave's mouth now are they god which remains unto this day jesus christ came out three days and three nights you go in that cave today you'll find 10 sets of bones of man you go where jesus was buried you ain't gonna find one bone five otherwise i was thinking the antichrist 10 king five sets of bones are still there and you can't find one set of the bones of god how's that they died the same death that jesus died and yet they're still buried they're still there today unless they're not in a museum somewhere you can't put jesus in a museum and that day joshua took mechadia whatever and smote it with the edge of the sword and the king thereof he utterly destroyed them and all the souls that were therein. He let none remain. He did unto the king of Mechadia, however, as he did unto the king of Jericho. Then Joshua passed from Mechadia and all Israel with him unto Libna and fought against Libna. And the Lord delivered it also in the king thereof into the hand of Israel. And he smote it with the edge of the sword and all the souls that were therein. Look at Exactly what God told him to do. He let none remain in it, but did unto the king thereof as he did unto the king of Jericho. Jericho was the setup. Jericho was the standard. And Joshua passed from Nineveh and all Israel with him unto Lachish, and encamped against it, and he fought against it. And the Lord delivered Lachish into the hand of Israel, which took it on the second day. Oh, that took two days. Or maybe that second day is the day after they did Libna. And smote it with the edge of the sword and all the souls that were therein, according to all he had done to Libna. Destroy, utter destruction, destroy that city, burn that city, no one living. Do you imagine Rahab sitting with it? Because she's in Israel. Do you imagine her thanking God right now? Because all these cities, not one person is living yet her and her family are living by the grace of God. And God keeps saying, remember Jericho? And Rahab's run, going back to Jericho that time she helped Israel, that time that God spared her and her family. I guarantee she's counting her blessings. Verse 33, And Horam the king of Gezer came up to help Lachish, I'll help you, and Joshua smote him, and his people until he had left him none remaining and from Lachish Joshua passed on the Elon and all Israel with him and they camped against it and fought against it and they took it on that day and smote it with the edge of the sword and all the souls that were therein he utterly destroyed that day according to all that he had done to Lachish and Joshua went up from Eglon and all Israel with them unto Hebron. And they fought against it. And they took it and smote it with the edge of the sword. And the king thereof. And all the cities thereof. And all the souls that were therein. And he left none remaining. According to all that he done to Eglon. But destroyed it utterly. And all the souls that were therein. And Joshua returned all Israel with them to Deber. And fought against it. And he took it the king thereof and all the cities thereof and they smote them with the edge of the sword and utterly destroyed all the souls that were therein he left none remaining as he done to hebron so he did to deber and to the king thereof as he had done also to Libner and to her king so joshua smote all the country of the hills all the south of the vale valleys 
all the springs and all their kings. He left none remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathed animals and humans. I'll tell you what they were doing with the animals that America will allow next. As the Lord God of Israel commanded, see, God, command, thou shalt not kill. What do you explain, chapter 10? And Joshua smote them from Kadesh Barnea. That's not old grounds for him. That's where him and Caleb went and came back. Even into Gaza, the Philistines, and all the country of Goshen, even unto Gibeon. There's those people that they swore. And all these kings in their land, which is now Israel's land, did Joshua take at one time. And this is one unity. Unity as a group of Israel went in there and conquered. Because the Lord God of Israel fought for it. So it isn't Israel that did it. It's God that did it. And Joshua returned all Israel with him. Onto the camp to Gilgal, or Gilgal. And so here he comes back to the camp Gilgal with the army men, and there's a royal assembly. Here they come. How did it go? You won't believe how many cities we kicked butt. And all Israel, and all Israel came back. And there's only one group of people that survived Gideon. And there's only one family that survived Rahab. Now, I don't know how much Rahab read the Bible afterwards, but every time, as on to Jericho, she's got to thank the Lord God because everybody in Jericho died but her and her family. There's coming a time when we get into eternity, the great white throne judgment. There are going to be people in my family are going to go off in Lake of Hell forever. And there's only one person i got to thank that I'm not going with them. And that is Jesus Christ, the gospel, that he suffered and died upon the cross, according to scriptures. And he was buried, and he arose again the third day, according to scripture. I can only look back and say, hey, I believe. And as far as my family, aren't you going to feel bad? Yeah, I'm going to feel bad. Tears are not wiped away after. But as far as I know, and I'm not saying 100%, but most of my journey of my family, I told them how to get saved. If my dad were to die unsaved right now, I told him over the years. I witnessed to my grandma before her, she died. I witnessed to cousins. Everyone who has died, I believe in my heart, I told them. You imagine Rahab, she's probably had some family members coming like, no, 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 no. I don't hear it. I bet you not everybody in her family went in her room that day. Right? You think everybody in her family? Is not Rahab? And said her mother and father, are they not hugging each other? Thank you for telling me. You hear what they say? As unto Jericho, uh, why couldn't our family listen? Why couldn't the people listen? I guarantee she invited them. Why? How do you get that? Look at Acts chapter 10. Cornelius invited everybody. You know, you put the invitation out there, it's up to them. They come or they don't. But I'll see people cast off in the lake of fire for all eternity and say, Lord God, I thank you for saving me. And once that's over, we go before the, God, the throne of God and all we do is worship and praise Jesus. And not only will I be there worshiping Jesus, you'll find me over there by the cherubim because I want to hear what they sound like. Outside of Jesus Christ, I want to hear those cherubim. There must not be a greater voice of a holy voice ever to hear these four beasts crying out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And they never get sick and tired of it. That's all by Jesus. Israel's going to get the land all by Joshua. Isn't it great, the two? 